singer by the name of Johnny Carroll, a rockabilly singer of that era. And he had a gig at the Texas Theater. This would be late 1956. And uh, our group, of course, backed him on stage at the Texas Theater. Uh, it was backstage that Jack Ruby showed up along with a guy by the name of J.G. Tiger, a good buddy of his. And the two of them were very interested in us as a group uh, joining Agva, if you could, if you could believe. That's the American Guild of Variety Artists and doing some shows with them. And so make a long story short, Jack Ruby took our name and then he also invited us to, after the show to go to an Agva meeting which was over in another section of Dallas at um, Ed McLemore Auditorium. And uh, we sang a little bit for the, uh, that little gathering. Uh, in the meantime, I also had made uh, several trips and continued to do so and up through about 1962, uh, made trips to Dallas to see the shows, Jack Ruby's, uh, the Colony Club and the Theater Lounge. They were within a block of each other. And uh, they staggered their shows so that we could actually go over there and spend three hours and catch three shows. And uh, that was uh, a fun time for us guys from the little small town of Cleaver. So that's how I became acquainted with him. I also, during that time, heard the scuttlebutt that uh, be careful with Jack Ruby, he's mafia. And so you can see my interest when I saw Jack Ruby kill Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, something really stunk. And uh, that was how I got started in this whole thing. What, what do you mean by the stench? It's just like something isn't right in the sense. Oh, yeah. That, uh... when, when the cops allowed Jack Ruby to shoot the Oswald, uh, uh, I thought at the time that it was silencing him. They didn't want to. They didn't want to. Uh, his story to come out. I have learned later that the reason they silenced him is because they didn't have any evidence against him in reality, that what they had probably most of it would be thrown out of court. And uh, a lot of it was concocted, especially his story. And uh, the evidence is just no good. How can you bring a guy to trial? That would open up a new can of worms. So uh, that's the reason they silenced him. In my opinion, you know, that's a very good. Uh, that's, I wouldn't disagree with that. In all honesty, I mean, at first I would think the same thing what you thought at first, but uh, it, it by going through the evidence myself and uh, the interrogations as such, I'm basically just uh, come to the conclusion that they had nothing on him, and uh, they um, had to coax the whole uh, lineup witnesses as such. Um, which is a terrible travesty of justice. I think Ian Griggs already wrote about that years ago. And mm -hmm. uh, so did uh, Jill Jesus as well and uh, a few others. And um, <clears throat> I had to re -go, I had to go through the lineups myself and I was just like, and I didn't want to do it, but I had to do it because it was part of his interrogations and so forth. So, um, and it just, you know, the whole thing just, just, just stank the high heaven there and then. But uh, there are several instances where it, uh, where it absolutely stinks the high heaven. So yeah. you you see the it, you see the assassination and you know about Ruby killing Oswald. Um, what what happens next? Are you right away involved, or it, it, I'll, we have to wait a year or two before you finally say, like, "Oh, I'm going to investigate this." Is uh, well, I immediately started reading everything I could find. I, at that time, I took a couple of uh, local newspapers, actually three, the Cleveland one and also the Dallas Morning News and uh, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. Right. And so I clipped and followed all of the activities surrounding that in those stories and in Life Magazine and Newsweek and so forth. And so I began to collect that and read it and. Uh, uh, about 19, they immediately printed nationwide copies, or well, worldwide, really. Associated Press and, and United Press International printed the Warren Report. And that came out shortly after uh, September of 1964. I got a copy real quick and read it. 
immediately. And uh, for a short while, very short while, I thought, well, maybe they had something. But the more I read, and then a, a book came out that probably all of you have uh, have read, and and it made an impact on you. Mark Lane's book, Rush to Judgment, came out. I read that, and I was I was in the ball game. It wasn't long after that that they did a a book review in the Fort Worth Star Telegram of Ben Jones's second volume of Forgive My Grief, and I had not heard of Penn Jones Jr., but he was 20 miles away in Midlothian. Uh, and I got in my car and went and introduced myself. We became fast friends. I bought everything that he had. I bought Sel uh, Sylvia Meyer's book from him. I bought, uh, he, he had purchased several copies of the Warren Commission 26 volumes, as well as the report. So I ended up buying two of those from him, one, one for my office at the time and, and one for home. So I always be real close. And that's how I got started. Penn and I began to run around and talk to witnesses and uh, make little presentations. I carried his projector <laughs> when he made talks. If he went to the Lions Club or some, uh, you know, civic-minded club and made a little speech while well, I was his assistant. And uh, so that's that's my start in all of this. I decided in 19, uh, I guess about 1967 or 68 to uh, to write. And uh, that's that's how I got started. I, wow. I, we, we began to write uh, cover up in, in about 1968 and we finally published it, self-published it. I couldn't get a publisher. Uh, in 1976. So uh, if you're going to write a book, you better put about three times the time limit <laughs> you think you could do it in. A... <laughs> one, of <the> funny... <laughs> one of the funny things is that I told Penn I was going to write that. And he had he had a, just a few copies of a little leather covered Forgive My Grief Volume 1. And so he gave me one and he wrote in it, he said, Gary, write the book. You'll make no money, but you'll sleep better. <laughs> and that is the honest truth. And uh, that's how it turned out for me. Got that's it. the beginnings. Got it. Hi there. Hi. Um, just a quick question. When did you meet Larry Harris and what was he like as a person? Well, when I, I began to talk about writing a book, uh, I passed the word around to Mary Farrell, to Penn, and, and to others involved in this, that I needed a good young writer. I was an architect. I'm not a writer. I've never had a writing lesson in my life. And uh, so Larry Harris came along about that time, and we got together. And I, I, to me, he was a great writer. And uh, we would get to my office early in the morning, and we'd go over what he's going to write that day. I had already outlined and, and uh, you know, had in mind exactly where I was going with it and had done the research on it. And uh, we'd, we'd sit and uh, discuss it in the mornings. The next morning, he'd come in and bring what he had written. We would go over that and talk about what he was going to write that day. And it was just, uh, that's the way it progressed. Uh, then after we finished that, we had it typeset and I physically put the book together and uh, had it printed since I couldn't get a publisher. From a timing perspective, it's kind of interesting because it was released uh, during the HSCA. Was this... Um... Actually, it was released before the HSCA. By yeah, just before 76. Uh-huh. Uh, but there was a real interest, I, I, you know, because mainly because of Bob Broden's bravery in showing the Zapruder film on national TV in 1975. Yeah, and, and then you get that whole debate about. That's right. And so yeah, it was all heating up about that time. And so uh, uh, it would have been a good time if I could have got a national publisher. I think it would have been a very popular book. 
Yeah. Was there anything suspicious about Larry's death? I wish I could tell you that I had investigated that. I haven't. It's way up a long ways from Cleburne, Texas to Ohio where he was killed. Uh, my understanding is, is that he ran either into the rear of a, of a large 18 wheeler or a large truck or head on. I'm not sure which. Uh, is there anything suspicious about it? I, at that time, he and I were far apart uh, geographically and we communicated only occasionally. And so I really don't know what he was working on. If he were working on something that was important to the people who want to keep the lid on this thing, uh, it, they, it, would not be, it would not be surprising to me. He was very good on Tippett, wasn't he? Yes, yes. Uh, it was a dangerous area, wasn't it? <laughs> probably so. And yeah, you know, high mortality rate. To show how gung ho he was, he, you may not know this, may, and you may. Uh, during that early period, he got a job with the post office department so he could deliver mail in the Oak Cliff section of yeah. town. And so uh, we learned a lot. Yeah, he, he worked with Ken Holmes, didn't he, as well? Yes, worked with Ken. Yeah. Unfortunately, Ken's dead. Yeah, yeah, I believe so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can see that, Scott, you got your hand raised. Do you want to come in with a question? Yeah, thanks, Tony. Uh, hi, Gary. I've, I've met you a few times at uh, Chris yeah. Gallup. I um, recognise your, your, your face. Good yeah, to see you. So it's good to see you again. Uh, I just wondered if uh, you had met Roger Craig, and if you have met Roger Craig, if you've got any recollections and stuff. I met Roger Craig right after he had gone to Jim Garrison's uh, the, the trial of Clay Shaw down in, uh, down in New Orleans. Uh, Penn brought him over to my office. Penn had uh, actually, uh, there had been a threat on Roger's life and Garrison had called Penn and said, this guy needs some help. So he brought him over to my office. I interviewed him and recorded him uh, about that time. In fact, I tell the story tell his story pretty completely and cover up because of my uh, in interview with him. And great guy, uh, tall, thin, nice looking, and uh, personable and honest. That's how I would describe him. Uh, I think he would have been a great policeman and uh, had he lived so long to, to stay in that line of work. But they crucified him. And uh, whether you believe he committed suicide or whether you believe someone killed him, really doesn't matter. They had already ruined him and killed him uh, by reputation. Can, can we put this back to um, the sheriff's department itself? Uh, well, naturally, if you go against Decker, Sheriff Decker, uh, you're not going to be popular. Up until that time, he was... Decker's boy. I mean, he was uh, an up and coming uh, deputy. Uh, but uh, after Garrison and after he wouldn't shut up, of course, they dismissed him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, um, I mean, I believe Craig as well, especially uh, with the sequence uh, that's in your book, uh, Tony, that's on pages 33, 4, and 5. Um, <clears throat> about the uh, Roger Craig and the Nash Rambler as such. Um, I, and also um, I put a lot of weight on um, the confrontation inside uh, room 317 where um, uh, Craig came into uh, Fritz's office and uh, pointed Oswald out to him and so forth. Um, <clears throat> Fritz does his best during the Warren Commission to basically claim that Oh, yeah, I don't know, maybe, yeah, we talked to him in the outer office, just that, you know, that kind of lingo. Whereas um, what a lot of people don't know is that the front page of the Dallas Times Herald uh, the next day, the morning edition, has got like the top half is devoted to Roger Craig and the uh, Nash Rambler uh, situation and the fact that he confronted him uh, in the uh, interrogation uh, room uh, of Will Fritz inside 317. 
that the, the speed of, of 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 that segment basically, and on top of that, there's a report by uh, James Bookout who states clearly in his report that at five seventeen in the afternoon that uh, Roger Craig walked in. Uh, so really on the minute, basically, just looked at his watch and basically makes a report of that, of uh, that Roger Craig walked inside uh, that office as such. But, I yeah, think at, was... last, at last count, we had about four uh, supporting testimonies of people who uh, said that they saw the same thing, basically, and uh, that Roger Craig saw. So one of them, uh, a guy named Robinson, I interviewed because I found a document where he was supposed to appear before the Warren Commission and give testimony about what he saw. This at, he, he was to follow Roger Craig. He couldn't do so at that time, and they never called him again. On his, on his letter, or on his, in, his uh, inv invitation to appear before them, it's got in big red letters, KP. Uh, some of you may not know what that means. It means key person. So Mr. Robinson was a key person because he saw what Roger Craig saw. And uh, then they buried that. I didn't find that out for years after cover up. Gary, do you, do you know what was planned for Oswald had he made it to the, uh, the county jail um, on that Sunday? Do you know what was Just like? What a uh, kind of itinerary he had. I, I've heard that there was supposed to be a press conference schedule scheduled. Where people I, I don't. Re I don't recall exactly what would have uh, taken place. Uh, normally, you uh, when you're indicted or you're charged, uh, you go from the uh, local authorities to the county authorities, and you're held over for trial. And probably Decker uh, may have had a plan to uh, to have a press conference and and maybe say some more things. Whether he would have let Roger Craig say anything or not, that remains to be seen. You know, I wish we I wish it had happened. And uh, do you think Lee could have been tried in in Dallas? Uh, I don't know that. Probably, you know, uh, trials here in Texas, you know, they can they can move them. In fact, you know, Jack Ruby's trial, he, he got a a uh, new trial order and they were taking him to Wichita Falls, Texas, which is 150 miles from Dallas to have his new trial. And, and uh, they were about to transfer him there when they found out he had galloping cancer and uh, suddenly died of a uh, thrombosis. Yeah, I have heard that. I, I know there's a, um, there's a document that states, I think it was Jager Hoover says it, is like at the present time, the case we have against Oswald is, is it very strong? Is it very strong at all? Uh, you haven't got any that's evidence to get a conviction. That's an understatement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they had no case at all. So I've I've co-authored a book. It's coming out very soon, and it, it kind of details goes through all the key evidence in the case, and I try and outline why there is no such thing as like chain of possession of the evidence, etc. I don't believe there would have been any case. There could have been any case brought against them because there is no evidence to convict. Mm. That's my opinion. It yeah. sure is, and that's the reason he had to die. They couldn't. If, if uh, he was not guilty, they had to go look for the guilty. And they certainly didn't want to do that. See, at the besides, time... uh, sorry, besides Roger Craig, did you, um, you spoke also to Richard Carr? Yes. And also uh, Gerald Hemming? Yes. Um, so, first of all, Gerald Hemming, um, which is a bit of a step outside the Dallas pond you've been fishing in regarding research for your book. Right. What led you to talk, to basically seek him out and talk to him? Well, I was working, of course, with the, uh, what was then the CTIA, the Committee to Investigate Assassinations. A letter came, later came on board with that. And uh, 
Later, we converted it to the AARC. I was the secretary when uh, that became a nonprofit and became the AARC. Uh, Bud Finsterwald and that group had a large file on Hall and Hemming and, and uh, these guys. And uh, I became very interested in Hemming because actually I thought Hemming was seen on Elm Street just before the assassination, uh, carrying a rifle. <laughs> and uh, I later learned that that was not so, but that, that was kind of my interest in him. I didn't talk that much to Hemming in those early days, but later I got to meet him personally. And, uh, you know, a very, very, <laughs> believe it or not, a very, very cordial and, and easygoing and, and uh, you know, nice to know. Right. And then you've got Richard Carr, which is quite interesting as well. Of course, he saw something he wasn't meant to see and uh, most people try to get rid of as such from a, from a testimonial point of view. I, I interviewed him and, and recorded his interview, still have it. Um, probably one of these days I need to transcribe all the interviews I did or make them available. But, uh, you know, that's that's difficult to do. I have such a huge collection of, of files and, and uh, that sort of thing, photographs. I've been putting some of the stuff, uh, especially the photographs and slides, on a, uh, a website called um, JFK CSI Dallas or something like that. And you can click on a link uh, that they put up there. And there's some good, great photographs. I mean, some second generation stuff that people haven't seen. And uh, go in there and look at it. Yeah, the Willis slides are there. And, uh, you know, there's quite a few uh, Dealey Plaza pictures, uh, aftermath uh, photographs in black and white and in color. I, so, uh, I, yeah, I talked to Wilma Bond and she's actually uh, sent me copies directly from her original slides. And uh, that was early on. And I printed some of those. As the SL Reed slides are on there. They're interesting. And, yeah. Um, I don't know what, I don't remember what, all that's on there, but visit the site because I'll be putting some of the early stuff on. Uh, for instance, I think there'll be a real interest in uh, Jean-René Suetra, uh, the Frenchman who was in Dallas on the day of the morning of the assassination and was flown out by uh, orders of someone in Washington. Uh, that's the story anyway. I think there'll be a lot more coming out shortly about him. I wrote about him in 1977, you know, and uh, how long ago is that? That uh, I wrote two or three article, articles back in 77 and 78. I need yeah. to put them on there just to show that, hey, we, we're trying <laughs> to do the work that the authorities failed or refused to do. Um, what was the goal with the book, actually, in comparisons to, um, you know, you've got whitewash, accessories after the fact, and so on from the, from the late 60s and early 70s. And then you're, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, coming up with the book. What was the, what was the uh, goal, actually, as such? Well, my goal, uh, and I state that, I think, in the preface, preface of the book, that my goal was to uh, write a book that anybody could pick up and read and, and get a good understanding of, of the problems with the uh, Warren Commission's uh, conclusions about Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, you can, you know, the average person won't pick up a Sylvia Meyer book, and it's a great book. Yeah, it's uh, one of the best. But it's, but it's so detailed that, uh, you know, they quickly... You know, I can't understand this or this is too complicated for me or something like that. I wanted to put something down in in simple form. That's that's the way my architectural practice was. My my architectural practice was based on the uh, K.I.S.S. Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, and that was to design a building and, and draw the working drawings 
prepare the working drawings in a in a manner that easily can be read and and uh, put together. And right. that's what I wanted to do with the book. With um, with the book, um, you know, with I don't know how much time you spend on the documentation that's been coming out since the release of the book and so forth. Is there anything it's, that you found out afterwards that was most surprising for, for Gus, what you wrote down and what you find out 10, 20, 30, 40 years later? As such? And you go. Uh, I'll, I'll say this. Yes, I have continued to follow it. Uh, but that's an awful lot of documents. And pouring through those is, a, is going to be a lifetime work. Uh, my lifetime is is not too long now, and uh, so I'm concentrating really on uh, helping other writers and people with their research. Uh, I, I I may publish again. I've written a number of things, and uh, because there are new revelations that uh, that, have, or that are in the documents that uh, they hid for years, and. Uh, Understandably so, if you want to fool the American people and and uh, concoct a, a story that uh, you, know, you want to pass off as truth. There's no truth to what they did to Oswald. Daddy, you ever to did, you ever, did you ever fear for your personal safety or were you ever intimidated when you were researching this case in the 60s and 70s? Uh, I, I'm naive about that kind of thing. And uh, I had my office broken into twice uh, during the House Select Committee. And um, just to give you a little quickie, uh, the same week that they broke into the safe at the House Select Committee, they broke into my office. Now, I, I don't know that this is true, but I had sent them my interview with a man by the name of Dr. Alderson, who uh, told me about Swetra and his relationship to Swetra and how the FBI had surveilled him for a few days and finally confronted him about the whole John Swetra affair because they were buddies back in France in the, in the mid 50s. Uh, I interviewed him and sent the transcript of that interview and also let the committee uh, hear the recording of that interview. Very revealing about how the FBI, you know, basically they told Alderson that Swetra either killed Kennedy or knew who did. And that people from Washington, these are FBI men, people from Washington had uh, flown him, had him ordered, ordered him flown out of Dallas at, uh, the same day. So I don't know whether they were looking for that uh, or just what, but uh, you'll notice there's no mention of Swetra in their House Select Committee volumes or report, which is very strange to me because they had it very early on. Sorry, I've just got a question quickly. Sorry, um, Johnny. Um, Bart, this is, this, this is great. We've got an awful lot of questions coming through. Do you, can I just check with you, Bart? Do you want to take these questions at the end of your interview? Oh, or... if they want to ask them now, I'll let them ask them now. That's then. fine. Okay, yeah. so I just want to th thanks. Go ahead, Johnny. Sorry about that. No, I was just going to ask Gary if any of the witnesses he had interviewed, um, if they felt intimidated or they were, they didn't really want to speak about certain things. Well, uh, yeah, Beverly Oliver was very intimidated, not only by the fear of the authorities, but uh, fear of she had married into the mafia and she was very fearful because they told her to shut up, not talk about it. Um, there were, uh, you know, our dear friend Hill, uh, Mrs. Hill, Miss Hill, uh, was intimidated. Uh, Wilma Tice was intimidated, uh, fakes and all of that stuff. And we initiated a real lawsuit and uh, a liable claim against the American Medical Association, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the Dallas Morning News, David Bellin. <laughs> uh, we named about, oh, at least a half a dozen uh, people in the lawsuit. Uh, in fact, I, when I 
first gave my first deposition, well, our one attorney, Brad Kaziah, was facing about a dozen <laughs> attorneys from the opposer, uh, the opposing mm -hmm. side. And uh, I don't mind telling you, that takes a lot out of you. Don't ever, don't ever get in a lawsuit unless you just have to, because it's, uh, it's a pain, you know, it's something all the time. And I was really burnt out after that. We settled, we, we did well, as well as we could against that powerful uh, an entity. And uh, uh, we settled for a little less than a quarter of a million dollars and got to uh, write a letter of, uh, which they had not, would not approve either in the Dallas Morning News or uh, the JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, the Dallas Morning News would never let us and uh, the uh, JAMA had to because of the settlement. And so uh, that, that's the reason I pretty well, I didn't quit reading I, I didn't um, go into the documents that much during that time, but uh, later when they started releasing the documents, uh, I really became quite interested again. And the AARB, I uh, think, was a real positive thing after JFK. And uh, so I didn't totally quit. I just wasn't as active during that time, but it was primarily uh, burnout and economics. Legitimate for me. Um, just um, with regards to the ARB and et cetera, the research, in what direction have you been researching then since? I'm looking at everything Ruby. Okay. That's quite okay. a big thing. It's a big thing. And uh, as much as I can find on Ruby, uh, that's my history. It, it seems like I was thrown together with Beverly Oliver, you know, I didn't go looking for her. In fact, I'd only learned in June of that year. I met her in about September, I guess, of 1969. Uh, it was only in June of 1969 that I even knew of the Babushka lady. And that was because Richard Sprague, the original Richard Sprague had uh, written a long article detailing the photographic evidence and printed it in a little small magazine called Computers and Automation. And uh, that's my first experience with, and for me to run head on into her a few months later was quite a uh, providence, I guess you would call it. But, uh, I don't call it a coincidence. And, and uh, so I wrote her story. The story I, I wrote about her, I, of course, I didn't identify her. Uh, I wrote in the Midlothian Mirror Penn's uh, newspaper, yeah. and uh, then it appeared, uh, of course, in his Forgive My Grief, Volume 4, I think, uh, as a, uh, a part of that book. And uh, so, you know, that's just one of those quirky things that happened, and, and uh, so my dealings and knowledge, because of my experience, both in knowing Jack Ruby, meeting Jack Ruby, going to his club, catching the acts. I had caught Beverly's act previously and didn't realize that until later. Um, she, she was not a stripper. She was a singer, but she wore a real uh, short dress. <laughs> and uh, so uh, she was a beauty and uh, my connections with Shari uh, Angel and uh, other of those kind. I, I really pursued the, the uh, little Lynn right. at the and have uh, written about it uh, quite, a, quite a bit. And uh, the Rose Jeremy, I was the one that got Michael Marcades to uh, come aboard and, and uh, hunt out and tell his mother's story and that's a very good story actually i read the book it's uh, uh, it's a very it's better good. it's better than even you know probably and uh, there'll be more about that she was a very very important uh and valued informant for people yeah. yeah 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 um 
this regards uh, your participation with uh, JFK as such, um, were you involved in the, the man who killed Kennedy as well? Yes, early on. And uh, let's see, I, I think I'm in the first two. Right. But I, I assisted Nigel Turner in research and locating people and so forth for the making of, of one and two, I know. And uh, probably in, in a couple of other areas, I helped him. He always came to see me when he got into this country working on those. And uh, a great guy, as far as I'm concerned. I don't know how many of you were uh, privileged to meet him, but he was a great guy and did a great, uh, a great work, I think. And uh, should be still on television, but it's not. Fortunately, you can get it, I think, all on YouTube now or something. You can find it, at least. Uh, he also had one in the can that would have been dynamite. And uh, it probably will never see the light of day. Um, your, um, what's your connection with Marina Oswald? Um, I mean, I've always spoken with Marina Oswald, and, <clears throat> and you're probably aware that I investigate Prayer Man and... Uh, being Oswald and all that. And she said, we basically sent her some enlargement of some photographs, which were stills from the Darnell and the uh, Wiegmann films. And she just volunteered with us, us asking it. She says, it's Lee. And the funny part was that my pal at Ledoux called her and left a message. And he didn't expect a phone call back. But instead, 20 minutes later, after getting some fresh air in the house because she was fumigating the house, she said, and she called back and he was completely surprised so he couldn't record the call. And we basically called back and say, will you please confirm what you said so we can record this and we have this. And uh, she did without any hesitation whatsoever. But she also said, you need to talk to Gary Shaw because he knows about all the <clears throat> legality issues and prayer man, this, that and the other, because we asked her, Surely we're not the first ones who point this photograph to you and tell you about this as such, because this is something that's been going on close to 10 years. It's already been made mention of and so forth. What do you know about this? Well, she and I became good friends. Uh, I even got to talk to Marguerite a few times. Uh, I met both of his girls, sweet, good looking, nice, girls, uh, Rachel and June. And uh, actually, we were working with her and the girls at one time, Bud Finsterwald and myself, uh, on litigation uh, on behalf of the, of the family for false uh, uh, accusations. And um, we were looking for avenues in which to get that in the courtroom, where we could also get witnesses in the courtroom under oath and prove and, and call in the evidence that uh, they used to uh, quote unquote convict Oswald and uh, expose it for what it was and uh, as false. And uh, fortunately that never came to pass. Eventually Bud passed also and really uh, threw a kink into a lot of our uh, doings. Actually, when Bud died, and uh, I haven't told many people about this, but I'll tell you guys, he and I were writing a book together about the CIA and assassinations worldwide. Right. And uh, I, I don't know whether you know Bud's background or not, but uh, he, had, he was a, one of the guys that was pretty well in the know in Washington. And uh, he... Uh, he, not, he, he represented McCard in the Watergate thing. Uh, he represented uh, James Earl Ray at one time. He was in a position to know a lot. I myself, he hadn't confided all of it in, in me, but I knew that the book would be dynamite. And he died. He was at my home for a week, flew to Washington, working on it, and he flew back to Washington and Bang, he's dead. So 
the, I, I classify him as a strange death because it's strange to me. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, definitely. Um, Gary, you, sorry, yeah. go for it. Yeah, Gary. Uh, hi. hi. You, you put that forward in, um, it was just mentioned, uh, the Dr. McCady's book on, uh, on his mother, Rose. Um, a lot of people um, have, have stated, uh, you know, that um, Oswald knew Ruby, and um, and Rose gave that um, that same statement to um, to Fruge. Um, do, do you have any other information on that? Where that um, that Ruby and Oswald knew each other before the assassination? Absolutely, and, and more so now after the release of documents. There's numerous, too, too many for me to even begin to talk about who uh, knew of Oswald's presence and uh, association with Ruby prior to the assassination. There is absolutely no doubt that there was a man named Lee Oswald that was working with Jack Ruby. None. Right. And that's one of the things that I'll, I'm trying to uh, really nail down. And uh, because John, John Armstrong did a great job on some of the Lee Oswald, double Oswald and, and so forth. Um, and, uh, but it can be carried further. So it was the Oswald that Ruby um, wiped out that, that, they knew each other, yeah. It was an Oswald. <laughs> that's all. Um, that's all we can say. We, you know, uh, it was an Oswald that had to be wiped out. Now, whether it was the Oswald with, that was in and out of the club and and associating with uh, with Jack Ruby, I really don't know. Right. Uh, to this date, but I can assure you that someone using the name Lee Harvey Oswald or Lee Oswald was in and out of the club and uh, well acquainted with Jack Ruby. I'm, uh, I'd like to ask you about the, uh, the social settings, social demographic settings. Okay, so here we are in England and uh, we had our bit of colonialism and um, all other European countries and so forth and misbehaved in other countries and so forth when it comes to race. Um, for some strange reason in the JFK assassination, the race issue is pretty much ignored or non-existent as such. Whereas, say, for instance, the black employees of the Texas School Book Depository um, clearly show traces of intimidation and uh, especially not to divulge uh, too much and so forth. Um, what, what was your experience in those times? Because I know that, for instance, the Jim Crow laws were only by that time just about wiped off the table around that time in 63. Um, obviously, the law may have been swept off the table, but, uh, you know, um, mentality and uh, attitude uh, pro probably be pretty much the same as such. Well, you'd have to live in the 60s to really know, in the 50s and the 60s, to really know uh, what was going on with the uh, race issue. There was no race issue as such. We um, existed side by side. Uh, for instance, in Cleburne, we have a uh, we had a major railroad uh, uh, shop where they, uh, for the Santa Fe Railroad, we employed about that, that they employed about a thousand to fifteen hundred people. And uh, the track ran pretty much through the center of town. The blacks lived in the northeast quadrant, and the whites lived in the, uh, in the rest of the area. Uh, they had the freedom to go anywhere they wanted to, uh, pretty much, but they didn't go to school with us. Uh, so there was that division. And I think that there was an intimidation factor 
because they were white authorities. And, uh, you know, uh, if they told a, a black person what, what, so to speak, uh, that's what they pretty much did. And uh, really race didn't play a role, I don't think in any area of the cover up, so to speak, unless it was uh, Givens and, and uh, Bonnie Ray Williams and, and those guys, perhaps they may have seen or known more than, than they felt at liberty to talk about, but I don't know that. Okay, and what, um, how do you look at uh, people like Fritz and Elmer Boyd and so forth, like the detective squad, the robbery and homicide squad was looked at as the elite within the Dallas police as such. And kind what? of in Texas as such. Right. So, I mean, I'm not, here's my thing. A lot of people pointed the finger to Dallas and it's justice and this, that, and the other, but I could probably name up 30 cities where the same would have happened because the structure and the way things are basically being put together. It is the way, it was the way it was. Okay. Yeah. So that kind of factor. I don't know? think there was a better locale than Dallas to do what they did. And that's because of the, uh, the politics and who was running Dallas in every area uh, of life there. From the mayor who we learned, you know. CIA, that, yes, it, yeah. Yeah, that his, he and his brother were both CIA. It wasn't just Charles Cabell, it was Earl and, and Charles. And uh, I now know that uh, several of the CIA people who are suspects in that had family living right there in Dallas, Texas. So they could come in and not even check into a hotel. They could stay with family. And I'm talking about uh, Colonel Kale, uh, Rip Robertson, uh, these kind of guys who uh, Morales, I understand, even had a daughter living in Dallas at the time. And uh, so the machinations, were there uh, perfectly set up, really, I think, for, uh, for it to happen and for the cover-up to take place, right. if need be. What's your, um, and um, I'd like to know, what, what do you know about uh, this whole Harlandale Avenue uh, shenanigans and uh, the Cubans, basically? I mean, there's two pictures of Alpha 66 meeting, of which some people think they can see Oswald in the back of that particular photograph. Um, for for the size of groups that is there, 30, 40 people just having a chat about things like that, um, the, the finger always gets pointed to New Orleans and to Miami as such. But Dallas is part of this. In, 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 I don't know in how, in, in what shape and so forth, but it's obvious that this is really something that, that quite a few big people are hanging about in meetings and, and doing a lot of talking and so forth, you know. What's your take on this whole thing? Well, Dallas was a real right wing, extreme right wing. You understand? There's a difference between uh, uh, somebody who's right wing and somebody who's left wing and, and the extremists on both sides. Uh, they're different animals. But Dallas was built by extremists <laughs> on the right wing. Their, their whole political structure and, and life in Dallas was was based along those lines. So H.L. Hunt, you know, the Murkinsons, these are all big players. Uh, there are others with big money that uh, uh, played a role in there. The guy who was running for government uh, governor the next year, Jack Creighton, uh, was a wealthy individual who was running things and had office uh, downtown Dallas. You know. So, yeah. These were different people and the intelligence apparatus there. I think where I've read where most uh, intelligence groups, you know, like the 488th in Dallas and, and uh, so forth, would have eight or nine members in other towns and cities. Uh, Dallas had probably a hundred. <laughs> so, you know, and, and most of them probably were on the, either on the, uh, Sheriff's Department or the Dallas Police. So, 
it was really a set up place going in and they had the people with the wherewithal to crush any uh, uh, attempt to, to learn the real truth because if something went wrong. Th that's, that's another thing. There's plenty of evidence showing, especially in the uh, research of, uh, oh God, uh, uh, Vincent Salandria and uh, especially the guys that hung around there in 64, um, basically trying to find out, um, I forget her name from Oklahoma, Mrs. Uh, Shirley Martin. Uh, for Shirley instance. Martin. You know, mm -hmm. She was an incredibly brave woman, just mm -hmm. tossing five kids in a car and just driving down from Oklahoma just to Dallas, Texas, and just <laughs> interviewing people just there and then starting to well, call was, the FBI. There was a couple others. Mary Farrell remained yeah. behind yeah. the scenes for, for years, and she was working with a guy named Arch Kimbrough. Uh, yeah, of course. Dallas, and yeah. uh, they were building a chronology, which has been become very, very important to researchers, and uh, a very, very difficult task, uh, incredibly difficult. tedious task. Uh, yeah, 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 definitely. Mr. Is there anyone else who wants to ask a question? Mr. Shaw, this is Gary in Minneapolis, and uh, there's another gentleman with us, John Williams from. Uh, Washington State, but uh, earlier, prior to you coming on, we had a brief discussion about um, Marina and some comments that she made. And since you mentioned litigation, uh, we, we in fact were wondering out loud, why hadn't Marina pursued litigation? And I guess you answered the question now, but further, um, John and I interviewed uh, Madeline Brown for about six hours in 2000, 2001. And we trans transcribed the tape and we had not heard her say the first time through, uh, this was live in Dallas at her house. And she, um, we discovered made the statement that Marina told her that the authorities, not sure what, what that meant, whether it was Dallas police or CIA or whatever, picked up the Carcano Saturday from the Payne's garage. And then John subsequently reminded me today that he talked to her six months before she died and, um, said, did you say that? And is that what actually happened? And, and uh, Madeline said, exactly, that happened exactly the way I said it the first time. In your pursuit of litigation, did that idea ever come up about the gun? Well, I've got a thick file on what we were going to uh approach uh, the trial with, or if, if, it, if we could get it into court. And uh, I don't recall what all we were, were going to do, but uh, I know one of the things was to prove that uh, a lot about the Carcano, or at least bring out uh, the discrepancies in, in all of the evidence that he used a, a Carcano up on the sixth floor window. It was, uh, it would have been quite a task, but a very worthwhile one. And uh, to have Marina and the girls, you know, involved in it would have been a real plus. Marina has taken a position now the last time I talked to her, and, you know, she's had so many uh, promises and, and uh, things that she's probably going to be reluctant to do anything like that. But uh, the girls might. And... The one thing that I, you know, if you've ever watched, watched Chauncey Hope when we were interviewing him on, on camera, he cried because uh, of uh, what the girls and the Oswald family had to live through with this false accusation about being the assassin. And uh, I, I thought that was very unusual for a tough guy, uh, but I feel that way. They've had to live with a lie all their lives, and I think it's... Uh, one of these days, 
So hopefully uh, somebody will apologize and and uh, to them because of what they did to the family. Got it. Sure. Got it. Hi there. Just uh, Hi. I've, I've just got two questions, uh, just very quick ones. One, did you ever go to the National Archives and uh, handle any of the physical evidence of the case? I, I did a number of times to the archives. I never handled any of the material. I was interested in the documents. Okay. Uh, it, it was at the archives that I found the uh, the two documents uh, by Vince Drain that uh, uh, all, I, I don't know whether y'all know about that or not. Probably you should. Uh, there were two different documents, same date, same number, same everything, except one says that the uh, paper made uh, the, that the Oswald allegedly made the paper bag with matched. And then another one that said it didn't. Uh, so you had conflicting reports by the same agent and the same day, same document number, everything. But uh, in in uh, in conflict with each other. Yeah, I spoke to I spoke to Buell Fraser about two or three weeks ago, and I asked him um, on the ride back to Irvine on November twenty one. Did Oswald have a paper bag or did he have any materials to construct a paper bag or anything in his hands? And he said, no, he didn't. So that would, uh, to me anyway, that would kind of dispel that he, this myth that he made a bag at the Texas School Book Depository the night before, took it home to get the rifle, etc. cetera. Um, I, I, touching on Oswald's daughters, what's their opinion on their, their father and do they believe he is innocent? Uh, say that again. Uh, uh, Rachel and June, what's their opinion on their father and do they believe he was innocent of the crime? Oh, they've talked enough to people like myself that they do not believe that their father participated in that. While we're on the paper bag, let me, <laughs> one of the stupidest things that the FBI came up with or the authorities came up with, whoever, was the paper bag. Do you, do you know how many fingerprints they found on that thing? Yeah, just two. Or partial prints, was can, it? Yeah. Can, can you imagine a guy tearing off the paper, carrying it, folding it up, carrying it home, unfolding it, taking and taping it up, and fixing it up, folding it back up, putting it under his arm, putting the gun in it, and carrying it to the Texas School Book Depository and taking it out, uh, taking the gun out of it, and there'd be only that many fingerprints. Yeah. And no traces of it ever holding a rifle. Yeah, no oil. <laughs> you know, what's funny to me is um, there is no photographic evidence that the rifle, that the paper bag was ever on the sixth floor. That's correct. In That's fact, correct. is it Commission Exhibit 1304 with the dotted line? Is around it. I mean, this is just, uh, you think someone was making it up. <laughs> well, they did. They made I up a story. There's a problem yeah. with this because that's not. Hello there. <laughs> Gary, uh, Gary, could I ask you a couple of questions? Sure. It's Ian Hughes, yeah. I, I'm down as yeah. user on the thing. But my name's Ian Hughes, yeah. Uh, very pleased to meet you. And this is great, great. information. Thanks for coming on. Um, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. Um, uh, James Files and Judith Ferry Baker, there's I been a lot of effort to try and discredit them. What's yeah. your opinion on their testimony? Uh, actually, uh, I don't really have an opinion. Uh, when, when I was working with Joe West uh, back in those days when James Files first came up, and the way he came up is legitimate, uh, an ex ex-FBI, retired FBI agent, uh, Zach Shelton, uh, actually told West about files. Right. So, you know, I don't know what to make of him, and uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't write him off, nor would I write off uh, uh, Judy. Judy. Right. Yeah, do you say? And, and, and the reason I say that is because I really haven't had the time or taken the time to uh, to delve into either one of them. 
my area has has been different. Right, I see. Yeah, um, you said you're involved in the um, the men who killed Kennedy. That's very interesting to me, because um, uh, Gary Mack was saying that the the thing about the Corsican hitmen had no credibility. What do you think about that? Yeah. The episode about the Corsican hitmen. There again, I was I was deeply involved in that. Uh, uh, Steve Ravel and I became close friends. I got him on the track, so to speak, of Christian David. Right. Uh, because I actually, at that time, I had seen pictures of David and knew of his background uh, and uh, Michael Victor Mertz. And I, Bud found out for me that Christian David was in the prison in Atlanta. And so I, I said, you know, that would be a good pursuit, Steve. <laughs> you know, is to see what you can do and get out of Christian David. And he did. He followed up on him heavily, as you know, and he made a, yeah. a part of the men who killed Kennedy. Uh, you know, whether any of it is actually true, I couldn't speak to. But uh, I think we have to be open to, to the kind of evidence that was presented and uh, okay. and that's it uh, if, if it doesn't hold water we throw it away right right thank you very much that's great mm -hmm. yeah cheers best of luck yeah, just one more Thanks. question for me please um what do you make of Buell fraser's uh, recent uh, claims that he's seen a man with a rifle uh on the knoll <laughs> <laughs> Day late and a daughter short. There's an answer. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> Have you met Bill Fraser? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. What do you yeah, mean? Nice, and and basic, basically, he's pretty well stuck with his story through the years. And uh, for him to be writing a book now, uh, he's got to come up with something that uh, is a little bit more than what he's spoken about and spoken to over the years so Frazier um, has got um, a second set of ghost writers involved do you know who the first set was because um, I know that they weren't very happy with uh, his statements as such and they were very contradictory mm. and I think Deborah Conway was also involved uh, one way or another I know absolutely nothing about it uh, and about what Buell is doing so Thanks, I know Brian. he's been interviewed a lot yeah <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's correct. Um, what's your um, take on, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, the Victoria Adams story of her and Sandra Stiles going down the stairs on the, from the fourth floor rather rapidly, not hearing anyone on those stairs with their high heels clacking down. And um, Victoria Adams later on admitted that the elevator was running while they were coming down, although she only managed to say it off the cuff not in any uh, official uh, paper. I, I, I believe that, uh, what's the guy that wrote the book about Victoria? Very uh, Ernest. Yeah, Barry Ernest. I believe that's a good book. It's and, a very good book. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, I believe that uh, he pretty well nailed it with her. Uh, I don't believe anybody ran down the stairs, uh, truthfully. Well. I think it was too busy to notice Oswald because not just those two women, but uh, Otis Williams went from the landing of the front steps, went up to the fourth floor to get a better view and then made his way back down to the ground floor and then back to the second floor. I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty convinced that Lee Oswald was never on the sixth floor at the time of the shooting. Yeah. Now, he may have been up there earlier in the day. Uh, and, you know, other days of the week, but he wasn't in that sixth floor window. No. No, they would have seen him anyway, and he would have been recognized, especially with the color of his shirt. Um, the, um, did you ever speak to Roy Truly? Never did. Never did. Should have, but never did. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's funny that he, it turns out that his wife is a cousin. Mildred. Uh huh. You know about that, I guess. Yeah. Distant relation of someone. Um, 
Flying Tiger guy, yeah. Polly. Uh, oh, no. Chanel? Chanel? Uh, yeah, yeah, Chanel. Uh, Polly was a part of the final Flying Tigers, but yeah. Chanel was the one no. he's, that Miss one Truly was kin to. It went down and got a fresh one. He was a general, yeah, correct. Um, does anyone else have a question? Yeah, there is actually, uh, Bart. There's a question from um, Scott, Scott Reed. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tony. Uh, Gary, see, just going back to the, the right wing politics of Dallas back in the early 60s, uh, somebody that I've been researching and writing about, uh, that I briefly spoke to you about in Dallas was William Duff, Scotsman William Duff. Yes, uh huh. And I'm interested. A person of interest to me is uh, Winnie Buchanan. You're really breaking up, Scott. Uh, yeah. I don't Try know. That again, Scott. No, that's not good. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you now. Go ahead. Try it again. Yeah. Do uh, so I just start over again? Yes, uh -huh. yeah. we're talking about okay. Duff. Right. Now oh, I've lost you completely, Scott. Frozen again. Yeah, yeah. you just froze yeah, again. William Duff. Yeah, go on. Uh -huh. Do you want to turn off your video, Scott? Yeah. Turn off your video and just use the audio. Yeah. Turn off this video, yeah. Okay. That's better. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. you're fine now, Scott. Yeah. Okay. So uh, right. it's a lady Good. called uh, Juanita Buchanan who ran a bar in Dallas called the El Dorado Bar. And she claimed on the night of the Walker shooting to have seen William Duff and Lee Oswald in the bar together. Uh, and they left and they, William Duff came back after the shooting. Uh, and I've never really been able, Gary, to find out a lot about the lady. And I wonder if you knew more about Winita Buchanan, whether her version of that can be trusted, what kind of person she was, or even if you met her. I never met her. I, I tried to because I very I was very interested in her her story. Um, they moved quickly after the pretty quickly after the assassination to Florida, and uh, they died probably within an each uh, a year of each other in Florida. I do not know how. I know they're both dead and one of them was 54 and one of them was 56. And uh, so I never got to really talk to them about uh, about what they saw and heard. But her story is very detailed, pretty well detailed uh, in uh, Mary Farrell's chronology, I believe, if you've, if you've never read that. Uh, there was a Another lady named Sue Fitch, F-I-T-C-H in Dallas, yeah. who did interview Juanita. And uh, I think it's an important story because of uh, the Andre An Angelis yeah. portion, which is a, another story altogether. Yeah. Gary, is there, I mean, I don't want to, to, to tread on anybody's toes, but is there any documentation or is there, is there anything that I could liaise with you about in relation to Buchanan and uh, Angeles? Uh, yeah, again, you're kind of breaking up, but are you talking about the re the relationship between the Buchanans and uh, uh... No, I was just I was just wondering if there's any way that I could correspond with you uh, about those individuals to see if there's anything I can I can use in any of my research. Uh, I'm sorry, you're really. Uh, I think he wants to compare you. his research with you. That's what he would like to do. Oh yeah, I, I'd be glad to. Be glad to. Uh, somebody needs to write that story because it's it's interesting. Uh, <laughs> Buchanan worked for the company that. Uh, First had the Zapruder film there in Dallas. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Mr. Buchanan, not, not, Juan, not Juanita. Uh, who yeah. she, and uh, uh, it goes on and on. <laughs> Angelis, Angelis uh, real name was uh, Don 
Mun. He, help me. Yeah, Don Moon. Don Moon. Yeah. Uh -huh. His daddy was head of the CI, uh, CIO, uh, the labor union. Right. Was be was best friends with uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, it goes on and on. Because yeah. the story was with Don Moon that he flew into Dallas on the 22nd of November carrying with, a large sum of cash. With a bag of money. Yeah. <laughs> Which is not unusual in that time, by the way. Uh, that's the way politicians financed their campaigns and their lifestyle. Uh, there was no... <laughs> they no still crazy. do. <laughs> well, they still do, but it's a little more difficult now. <laughs> Back then, that was that was the only way to do it because you know there was absolutely no connection that way. Yeah. Now they can trace money a little easier because yeah. of various laws. Yeah, that's one right. other question, Tony. Just very quickly. Yeah, go if, for. It. If, if Gary has a view, because the research I've been doing is mainly around Duff and General Walker, and that's how the Buchanan and yeah. Andre Angeles all all comes into this story. <laughs> As, uh, do you have a view on who shot Walker, or <laughs> what, what, what do you know about that? Man, again, you really, really. Well, I hear about every other about, word. Um, the question was about Scott about what, the Walker shooting. Do you think who did it? Who did the shock, the Walker shooting? I don't know, but Lee Oswald didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. You got yes. it, Johnny. Did you ever meet Mark Lane? Yes. How yeah. was what was he like? Well, very very reserved. Uh, he he's not a mixer, so to speak. Uh, the only time that I got to meet him was when they had the critics conference with the House Select Committee back in probably seventy seven. They flew uh, about a dozen of us. Uh, to Washington to meet around the table with Blakey and his staff. And uh, he was there for one day. Yeah. What about Harold Weisberg and Sylvia Mayer? Did you meet them? Who? Harold Weisberg and Sylvia Mayer? <laughs> I, I, I got to know Harold pretty well. Uh, what a character, but I, I really liked him. And he, he was a crusty old man and, and uh, a fighter. And uh, very opinionated, and if your opinion didn't go his way, he could really tear you up. And, <laughs> and if, if, if you read some of his uh, letters and so forth, <laughs> you can discover that. But I liked him. I, I spent him. a year just going through the iceberg archive. Just the whole year, every day, I started going, browsing through PDFs and reading and all this stuff. And he basically slagged everyone off. He may have had dealings with them for 10 years, but he'd still slag them off afterwards. <laughs> I mean, because him and Richard E. Sprague were pretty close. And for quite a few years, and investigating Algen 6 and whatnot. And at some point, Sprague went off the rails, as, as Weisberg would say, and basically, you know, because he went nuts about the so-called dart gun in the umbrella. Mm -hmm. And that was the bit where Weisberg just went, no way, I'm not having this, and just started writing. But he, he did it with everyone. He did it with Posner. He did it with and literally anyone who basically crossed his path. He did it with Harry Livingston. Mm -hmm. And I've heard the phone calls and so forth, and it's all really cordial and nice, but uh, the letter writing is... Uh, Pure venom and uh, the daggers <laughs> stabbing in the back just continuously. Um, but if I could call him right now, he would be uh, a jewel to you know to talk with me and would answer any question that I might have. Uh, I found him, like I say, a crusty old man, but uh, he he believed his way or the highway. Yeah. That's for sure. What about Sylvia? <laughs> Did you meet her? Who? Did you meet Sylvia? Sylvia? Yes, uh -huh. at the same critics conference. I had communicated with her uh, during the writings, but uh, I only got to meet her uh, at the critics conference when she, she was there. Uh, are 
there are two transcripts of this uh, critics conference actually i read them about uh, two three months ago i went through mm -hmm. them and they are actually at Mary Farrell's uh, website because I was going to scan them in and then I started looking around and uh, there are two Why folders. is there two? Why is there two? Are they the same? Sorry. Are the, are the two transcripts the same? No, no it's morning okay. and afternoon. It's morning and afternoon. It's well, we were there. We were there two days. Right. Well, then it's one day and the other one's the other day. But it's okay. they, they, are, gotcha. they are like... Part A and Part B, and they're each 100 to 120, maybe 150 pages long. Mm -hmm. They are at Mary Farrell, because mm -hmm. I ran the riff numbers and found out about it mm -hmm. um, in the end, that they were online as such. But yeah, I remember them. I had made, met Tink Thompson previously, but he was there at, the, uh, at that conference. And uh, gosh, I can't remember all who were there. If you call their name, I can tell you whether they were there. Well, I know that Mary Farrell was there. I know that. Mary was sure. there. Yes. You were there. And uh, Mary Harris. I think, Larry I Harris. think Salandria may have been there as well, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no, Salandria wasn't there, but Harris was. Larry Harris was there. Was Ray Marcus there? Who? Ray Marcus? No. 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 All right. Okay. okay. We've got another couple of questions and a few people with their hands up. I mean, I want to start, if, and I will come to Richard and Ryan and Gary, um, but um, I've got a question from David, which I want to just put to you, Gary. Um, it's about, um, he's asking, can you vouch for Beverly Oliver's credibility, particularly <laughs> regarding her film and it being taken by the FBI SA Regis Kennedy? I can vouch for her credibility without hesitation. Uh, the only thing is, is there's a misunderstanding. Uh, she never said that that was Regis Kennedy. I took a, what I called my butt mug book at the time, which was a thick photographic book of people involved in the case in some manner, or some form. I let her go through it page by page. And when she got to Regis Kennedy's, she said, that's the man right there. I had none of them were labeled. She had no idea. I only told her late, later and wrote in the story that she identified uh, the photograph of Regis Kennedy. So whether it was Regis Kennedy, I don't have a clue, but it was a man who looked like him. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> um, and now I'm gonna go to Richard. You got your hand up and then I'm gonna come to Ryan and Gary. So go ahead, Richard. Hi Gary, thanks very much for- Hi uh, Richard, I've really enjoyed it. You you guys are doing a great job. I, I appreciate you. I just wanted to ask you, going back to what you said at the beginning of, of the discussion this afternoon, when your antennae first began to twitch um, after the assassination, did you find amongst your own circle of family and friends, were you very much a lone voice? Did, did anyone after, after Ruby acted on the Sunday morning, did anyone begin to openly voice the doubts as to the official line that was being peddled? Just about everyone. <laughs> just about everyone. Everyone suspicioned at that time that Oswald was uh, shut up. You know, they killed him because they didn't want him to talk. That was everybody's opinion that I ran into. Now, nobody pursued that except me and my family, but uh, that was the thought. Yeah, good. Interesting. Thanks. Um, sorry, um, if you can bear with me, um, Ryan, I, I want to bring in Neil, Neil Safady, because he's got a question. He's asked me for it a little while longer, then I'm going to come to you next. Thanks, Ryan. Neil, do you want to, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, hi, hi, hi um, I actually met you very briefly at Mansfield at um, Chris Gallup's thing a couple of years ago, so uh, it's good to talk again. Um, Roscoe White, you touched on that briefly. Uh, 30 years on, how do you reflect on that now and, and what, what do you think about his potential involvement? If you could see what I've seen and hold in your hand what I've held in my hand, you would believe the story. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's one of the strangest things I was ever involved with. In fact, Nigel Turner put together another men who killed Kennedy, the whole program. 
uh, was about that. And uh, it was amazing what, uh, what he was able to find out. I'm going to write about it. Uh, actually, I've got a guy that's going to write about it that I'm helping because it needs to be known. You know, if you'd have held in your hands those cables, there would have been no doubt in your mind. If you'd held in your hands and gone through the uh, so-called witness elimination book, uh, you, there would be no doubt in your mind. If you could hear all that Geneva, Ricky White's mother, told about her uh, conversations and overheard conversations with Jack Ruby about Jack Ruby when she worked for him and when her and Roscoe were there with him. Uh, the, one of these days, that story will resurface and uh, be important. Do you, do, you, do you think he went? Do you think he went on to Oak Cliff afterwards? Was he involved in the Tippett issue? Uh, that's what he wrote in the diary that was taken from. I will tell you this: when Ricky White was taken to uh, the FBI office in Midland by the, uh, I believe I believe the guy was the district attorney who Ricky first went to with the stuff, including the diary that disappeared. Uh, for days afterward, they surveilled FBI. I've got the documents where they surveilled. They followed both Tricia and Ricky wherever they went and really were watching their every move after Ricky told the story, what he had found and, and uh, so forth. So the FBI was very, very interested in what Ricky White had and what he was telling. Hmm. That's interesting. Did you, did you also, um, second question, if you don't mind, did you ever get a chance to interview Adrian Hamby, the teenager that ran into the library on Jefferson? No, I would, I would, I would like I... to interview him because I, yeah. I think what he, uh, what he has to say is important. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Think... I, I, I agree. I think there's a possibility that that whole thing might have been a, a diversion away from the Abundant Life Temple. Um, and if that, I, uh, that kid was only 16. Is he, is he still alive? Do we know if he's still alive? I don't know. I could look it up, but uh, I've not done so. I'm interested in the men in suits. Who, yeah, uh, yeah, the Secret Service or FBI that was supposed to be at the, uh, at the library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm interested in their statement. Uh, wrong man. When they, when they got to it, they, you know, found the guy... They said it's wrong man. The only way you know it's the wrong man is because you know who the right man yeah. is. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and just and one final thing, I don't want to be too greedy. Um, do you have any papers from Larry Harris? Do you have any copies of any of his work at all? Because uh, I've been trying to search for a couple of specific um, articles that he wrote, one in 93 for uh, a Dateline Dallas special edition and one for an Australian mm -hmm. publication in '94, both no, on the, both on the Tippett murder. I'm, I'm just I'm just wondering if yeah, on, you could help them. me help me find them, or if you do have them. Uh, I would just have to look. I've got a file on Larry Harris. I've got a file on everybody. I got your name now. I'll start <laughs> one on you. <laughs> I'll be a big I one. I knew I should have just been audio only. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now we stick a picture next on the top, mate. There you I'm, go. There I'm you dead. Go. I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to bring in um, Ryan next, but as obviously ask you as uh, if Emmett has any questions, we're happy to take those as well. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Emmett, Emmett has since left the room and has gone with his mother. Uh, hello. <laughs> Hello, Gary. It's it's nice uh, to see you. Uh, um, good to see you, man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I you I've got a I've been fortunate enough to talk with you several times, meeting you through Chris. And yeah. um, anyways, I always am fascinated to hear you talk. I was just messaging back and forth with Neil about that. I think you bring such a great um, history to bear to this case, and just the work that you've done is incredible. So thank you I as hate, always. I, um, I hate that I'm now the grandpappy and all. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough fair enough well we appreciate you joining us trust me Thank um you. 
very much. The main, the main question, I've had a chance to ask you a lot of questions over the years, but the main question, I've, I've got two questions for you. The first is, you, you touched a little earlier and talked a little bit about the Assassination Information Center that I think used to be on Munger in Dallas, the, the, mm -hmm. the one that was founded in the late 80s. Is that at all related to what Jim Lazar has done with the AARC in terms of physical? Okay, it, this is, so those are two completely separate entities. Completely separate. Okay, so a lot of the material and things that you had that were that were part of the information center, I would assume just either stayed in your possession or perhaps with one of the stakeholders that was was involved in funding or founding it, like you mentioned, Bud Fensterwald and some other folks that were. Well, it, when, when it was taken over by Cutler, uh, you know, he became the uh, the owner, so to speak, or half owner with Larry Howard. From uh, the time Larry Howard and Cutler passed on i don't know where the materials went okay okay so they may be partly uh, with uh, larry howard's wife uh, they may be partly with a guy named tom bowden who ran it for cutler when uh, when cutler kind of became the financial angel I, i'm not, i'm unsure okay well thank you uh second question i have is rather a loaded one so please feel free to elaborate or not as much as you'd like on the following topic. I but, shoot back. Uh, <laughs> I shoot back. <laughs> um, so Neil, Neil and I have, are working on something separate, but we've become, uh, he's got me interested in, in some characters associated with the DPD that were involved um, at all three big scenes that day in the Texas Theater Book Depository and the Tippett murder scene. So specifically, I'm, I'm just kind of asking for, I guess, a, a qualitative assessment on a couple of people from yourself, and that would be Westbrook, um, Nick McDonald, Jerry Hill, kind of some of the, the characters that we're all very familiar with and are very infamous DPD officers and kind of what your just overall thoughts on those people are, whether or not, I'm sure at some point in the past you'd spoken to all those characters or at least a, a handful of them. Um, can you share with us any qualitative thoughts you have on some of those guys? Well, I, I don't trust what they say, especially about this case. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I met Hosty. Not Osti. Uh, who else did you say? Westbrook, I, I never met. McDonald, okay. I never met. Uh, who, who was Jerry the third? Hill. Jerry Hill. I met one time. Larry Harris did do a short interview with with uh, him, and it's, he scared him to death. He said, "You know, uh, mm. I got really well acquainted with uh, uh, Patrick Dean." Okay. And uh, in fact. Uh, I rode around with him some in Dallas and we talked a lot. Uh, he, he never let a bombshell out. In fact, the last time I talked to him before he died, Penn and I went to his home in East Texas and uh, he, uh, he had retired because of his health. He had cancer. And uh, he, uh, his wife kept asking him to tell him what, what she wanted him to tell us, I don't know, but he, she kept pressing him to go ahead and tell these guys. He never did, and whatever he had, he died with, I guess. Uh, he showed me Jack Ruby's glasses, which Jack Ruby had given to him, and uh, he had a Jack Ruby's hat that uh, he, uh, he had uh, given to him. He was close to Jack Ruby because he was in and out of this club on duty. Uh, numerous times interesting he, can i just he, interject who yes. wasn't close with jack ruby i mean In i'm sorry Dallas to Police. say but is there any i mean the dpd does its best to dis, dis, distance themselves from ruby and so forth. yeah well you know met him blah 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 knew him yeah. around he brought some coffee and donuts Hell no, he knew everything. He knew every office, every door of that building, and he knew everyone who was behind it as such. He knew what door to knock on to get help of some sort. He knew exactly where to go. That's The reason he was in Dallas was to do that. He got to know all of them and ingratiating himself with them and uh, got by with a lot more than you and I know because of it. But that's what, crim that's what criminals do. <laughs> Gary, I've always, I've always thought that um, Jack Ruby didn't actually want to kill Oswald. Because didn't Ruby phone on Saturday night and say, 
<laughs> I meant to the guy was, but they didn't say something along the lines of, if you transfer him in that way, we are going to kill him. I can't uh, remember. I, I think you're probably right. He would like to have gotten out of it, but he had his orders and he had to carry them out. And uh, he was actually uh, tracking Oswald for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, with pistol in hand, he was in, he had a pistol in his pocket uh, on uh, Saturday night when they, uh, and Friday night when he was at the Dallas Police Department. He was ready anytime. Uh, what a lot of people miss is, is that he got a strange, and I think it was a coded letter from AGVA saying, do not send the letter today. It would not be rail received in Chicago or something of that nature, which tells me that right at the last minute, they were trying to get a hold of him to pull off killing Oswald for whatever reason, but he didn't get the letter. So, uh, he carried out his duty. What do you think would have happened if uh, Ruby tried to kill Oswald and, and failed? Uh, do you <laughs> think Oswald would have been put in some sort of protective custody or anything like that? Well, I'm sure they would try to do that, but they were never, ever, when it turned out this way, they were never, ever going to let Oswald talk publicly or go to trial, whatever it took. Uh, they'd take care of it. Did you ever speak to Marguerite Oswald? Did yes, ever... yes, I did. Uh -huh. What was she? What was she like? And do you know why she lies in an unmarked grave next to Oswald at uh, Rose Hill? No, I don't. Uh, she was she was a peculiar lady, as we would say down here. Uh, peculiar in in her demeanor, her talk, and uh, so forth. Uh, I didn't get to know her well, but I was in her home, uh, and uh, she uh, she knew that her, that her uh, son, in her opinion, was uh, innocent, but also she believed he was an agent. Did you know she made a phone call to President Kennedy and talked to President Kennedy in 1961? No, I never. What was never that? heard that? Never no. heard that. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what was said? Well, I don't recall what the authorities said was talked about, but, uh, you know, you can speculate anything you want to. But the, the logbook of his telephone calls at the White House has her listed. Wow. I never knew that. I never knew that. Wasn't she phoning to uh, try and get her? Um get Lee out of the uh, Soviet Union. She could have been. She could have been. It could have been a legitimate phone call. But just the fact that she yeah. did call and talk with the president, you know, is, you know, kind of peculiar. Not everybody gets to do that. <laughs> OK, I'm, I'm going to bring Gary Severson in now. Gary, thanks for your patience. You've been hand up for a little while. Do you want to just come in? Unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, Go for it, Gary. Mr. Shaw, um, Hi, Gary. Er, earlier, uh, just like my other question referred to an earlier discussion uh, this morning, um, I was trying to come up with uh, somebody that was here in Minneapolis until they passed away a few years ago. It was Bradley Earl Ayers. A-Y-E-R-S, The War That Never Was, was his book's Real title. Familiar. Real familiar with him, yes. Okay, and it became, in 76, it became the Zenith Secret. A CIA insider exposed the secret war against Cuba and the plot that killed the Kennedy brothers. Do you have an impression of what uh, he was about? Is he legit? Uh, <laughs> he came to see us at the center. Uh, before before the movie was being filmed there in Dallas. When he came on the scene, he said he was being followed and had to lose a tail. Uh, he spoke with us quite uh, a long time. No uh, important information that I recall. I'd have to look at the file to see what he said. 
but when he left, he called within 30 minutes and said he had been tailed uh, again. And, uh, you know, I thought he was paranoid. I met with him another time or two. Uh, and he did some work on our behalf in, with David Morales. We were already looking at that time at David Morales real strongly as being a uh, suspect in the assassination. And uh, we couldn't find him. And uh, he was able to trace him over to Arizona and he was already dead and buried so forth. But he said he was knocked in the head and his briefcase taken away from him at that time uh, by persons unknown. And, uh, you know, I don't know what all was true, what all he was, was not. I know that when he finally wrote in the second edition, and, and I think you called it Zenith. Right. Uh, what he told about me and Finsterwald and, and Darf, Bob Darf from California and uh, the center was totally false. In fact, I wrote a, a review uh, of the book in, for Amazon. You can go in there and read it. And, and uh, you know, that what he, what he said about us was absolutely untrue. And uh, I, I kind of dismissed him from that time. Yeah, I had a couple, I don't know, two, three interactions with him. And it, it uh, kind of fits your description too. A lot of, a lot of paranoia. He, mm -hmm. I met with, I, I was at his compound outside Minneapolis. I call it a compound because it was heavily. <laughs> heavily guarded mm -hmm. as if he was paranoid <laughs> yeah. and uh, being, being paranoid doesn't mean you don't have real enemies right right <laughs> and, and so within a few days he died when I got to him he had just gotten out of the hospital as I told the group earlier this morning so I'll, I'll leave it at that that gives me some uh, perspective what about I wouldn't discount I would discount uh, his information about uh, J.M. Wave and, and the activities that he was personally involved in, uh, you know, not everything yeah. he told was false, but what he, what he, he really got mad at us for whatever reason, I don't know, uh, and, uh, and wrote a very stinging uh, section of his book was about the center and myself and others. Oh, and, I'll have to take a look at that. Yeah. Do you I have any... Read my rebuttal of it. <laughs> okay. Did he? Did he have? Uh, did switching topics? Just one more question. Uh -huh. Does Bill, Did Billy Solestis have any redeeming qualities? <laughs> I got to know him real well. In fact, he wrote his wrote in the book that he gave me that his daughter, I guess, wrote. You know what a great friend I was, and all of that stuff. Uh, we were never friends, but somebody will read that one of these days and think we were, perhaps. Uh, he had redeeming qualities. Not everything he told was false. Uh, the, the things that he would lie about is the criminal activities that he was involved in. Uh, when he talked about Johnson and his association and dealings with Johnson, I, I were right on from what I, I could find out. So don't discount sure. him completely. What, that was uh, funny, I I, I caught him in a driving down the freeway in outside of Dallas, and I was calling from up here in Minnesota. And uh, I was surprised that he even answered his car phone. And uh, I said, "So is this how you describe the triangulation in Dealey Plaza?" So I did the standard spiel. And he said, "Yep, that's exactly the way it happened." <laughs> I mean, it was like I could have yeah. told him there were. Uh, people in uh, a building five blocks away that had uh, super uh, shooting skills and he might have agreed to just about anything you'd come up with it just seemed like he was really a, a con uh, maybe maybe at that stage of his life maybe he was and yeah, maybe yeah. He, had, he envisioned himself being a lot more acquainted with the activities that were going on at that time sure. uh, no, I, I I couldn't speak for his veracity on anything other than 
you know, what he, what can be confirmed basically. Right. Right. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank What's, you. Um, what do you know about um, the criminal intelligence division paying it special attention and care to the workers of the Texas school book depository after the assassination. So I'm talking December, January, February of 64, even March until they're actually uh, talked to by people at the Warren Commission in Dallas as such. I mean, I can tell you what I know. I mean, I know that Victoria Adams was finished, uh, visited on February 17th of 64, where she was interviewed by Jim Lavelle. And Lavelle used uh, the excuse of having to interview her again as that they had a fire and that her file was burned as such. And they basically re-interviewed her. And this is also where the so-called encounter with Bill Shelley and Billy Lovelady, which never happened, uh, was all of a sudden uh, basically being pushed into the narrative as such. But there are also other people uh, like Ruth Dean, who, according to the list that they kept of the people inside the Texas School Book Depository, we call it the so-called revel list, which is a two-pager of people whose names were taken down. And it's Oswald's name with his Elspeth address, who's number one in that whole list. And um, there are markings behind Ruth Dean and somebody else. I can't really remember who that was. And it's also known that there are several people that have been watched. Also, they had a guard at the door when after it happened and so forth. There are all these indicators. But what do you actually know about these things that they were actually closely watched as such by the Criminal Intelligence Division? I can't speak to that, uh, Bart. Uh, that's not something that I've particularly followed or looked into. I would suspicion that these same guys were probably associated with the, uh, the military intelligence group there in Dallas and uh, are with uh, perhaps the FBI or CIA. They, they all were connected to uh, outside of their realm of activity as an employee. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Got Wish it. I could help you more, but I okay. can't. Go ahead. Do you know if Robert Kennedy ever visited Dealey Plaza? I'm, I'm unaware of him ever coming to Dallas, much less Dealey Plaza. Do you know if he ever conducted his own private investigation into the, the, the case itself? No. No. So. Uh, I would suspect that uh, he had intelligence uh, people who were knowledgeable of certain aspects of it that had spoken to him. And he, he knew, I think, well, I know he knew that his brother was not killed by Lee Oswald, that it was a coup. I have no doubt about that now. Do you think if he had won the presidency, do you think he would have uh, reopened the investigation? I think he would have tried, but he had probably got the same reception as his brother. Yeah. Do you think he would have been a good president? And did. <laughs> yeah, he did. Do you think he would have been a good president? Uh, I think I think John Kennedy would have been a good president. I'm not sure about Robert. You know, we really never got to experience uh, John Kennedy. And, and, you know, he had just that few uh, years. If he had got another four years, uh, perhaps we'd be different today. I don't know. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, can I just um, ask you um, about the future? So we've got the Project JFK trio working hard on digitizing your material as such. Um, you obviously have a big collection. I know about big collections because I've been going through one myself. <laughs> Many times where I wanted to put the, the end of a shotgun into my mouth and uh, because it's just unbelievable how much of this stuff uh, entails. And, uh, you know, most researchers have said, like, well, I'm just going to investigate the Secret Service. I'm just going to investigate the medical part. But Malcolm just did everything that is basically you can get your hands on. Um, what is the scope for your job 
uh, the job that is entails, like how much is actually involved and is there a deadline as to when it's all going to be available as such and, and so forth? What, what's in the pipeline? Well, it's, it's hard to say. I, I probably have every book uh, about the assassination. I don't know of one that I don't have. And uh, I've got one, two, three, four, four sets of stacking bookcases in there with all of that material, plus a lot of duplicates, plus a library on the FBI, the CIA, uh, the Bay of Pigs, you know. I've got a huge library uh, because I've tried to buy just about everything that pertains to that period of time. My, uh, my files in here, one, two, there's four, eight, nine, 10, 11, uh, about a dozen legal size file folders completely packed uh, with files. And I don't know how many plastic file containers I've got, but probably a dozen of those. Uh, it just goes on and on. But, you know, I've been doing this since day one, basically. And, and uh, so my collection is, is huge. My real theory is, is that one day somebody will look in here and say, look here, why didn't he follow up on this? Or uh, you know, why did he tell somebody about no, this? I've got, that. I've, I've got that with Malcolm's collection. I found uh -huh. a few things where I just went, what? this is incredibly important. He goes, I didn't even know I had it. And I was like, yeah. oh my God, it's vital, it's gold. <laughs> so he'd hear me, he'd hear me scream out in, inside the archive, go gold. And he goes, what, 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 what? And I'm just like, this document, it's amazing, blah, blah, blah. And he just went, I just scanned it. I just had Xerox it in as part of a 200 page collection of, of photocopies. And, uh, you know, and, you know, you can't look through every document. You're I think I've got the same thing. And, and uh, so I, I plead guilty. I didn't follow up on some that I did. I kicked myself for not interviewing some people that I could have interviewed. Wally Weston, for instance. You right. know, we didn't have we didn't have this web, uh, you know, we, we didn't have all the uh, tools that yeah. you guys have. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make them available to you guys eventually as best I can, you know, so that, you know, Penn Jones, one of the first things that he told me was that uh, Gary will not be able to solve this, but we can nail some stakes in the ground for future historians to follow up on and maybe maybe they can and that's my hope i think we know at least i feel in my my own mind that i know who was behind the murder i think i'm beginning to get more familiar with the individuals who probably pulled the trigger in Dealey plaza but uh, there's a, it's still a long way to go and and hopefully one of these days you younger guys uh, can <laughs> can find the stakes and uh, pull them up and and see what's there, and uh, that's about all I can tell you. Yeah, I'm just going to have what there's one more question from David here, Gary. If I can just read it out to you, he's asking about the criminal intelligence and military intelligence FBI links in Dallas, and do they extend to the right wing affiliations, such as the John Birch Society, the KKK, and things like that? Yes, this is just a simple answer. They were all connected to right-wing organizations of some type and some kind. And, uh, you know, that's, that was the mentality. And you didn't get to be a cop uh, unless you had that mentality. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else? Uh, yeah, Gary. Um... Another question, did you, did you ever um, look at uh, Tosh Plumley and his story of, of the, um, he claims he was on the South Knoll, not the North Knoll. Um, I, uh, and, yeah, and I, I don't discount, <laughs> it, it's funny. I got a call one day from Bud Fensterwald in Washington. I'm in Cleburne. And he says, meet me in Denver, Colorado. We got a guy we need to talk to. And so I got on a plane and flew up and met Bud. We uh, met 
Tosh Plumley and his wife. And he told us some stories. I believe he was actively involved in the things in Cuba and uh, I mean, in Miami and Florida and, and the Cuban operations and all that, like he says, I have a, a thick set of files that we got in Freedom of Information on Tosh and uh, the Roselli connection is, is uh, in those files. And uh, I have never bought into a shot from the South Node. And so I, I, that's all I can say about what Tosh says he was doing. That would not be a uh, good place to try to kill the president. You'd be shooting between a Secret Service agent, uh, Nellie Connolly, and Jack Will and Kennedy in order to hit the president. And, uh, you know, the, the places they fired from were, uh, I believe, already been pinpointed, and that's the no and everything all the way around to the criminal courts building because he was clean. A clean shot could be obtained at the president from those locations. Do you, do you, do you believe the, the hole in the windshield? I believe the hole in the windshield, yeah. Yeah. Because two witnesses saw it. One of them says he put a pencil through it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two or three witnesses, yeah. Um, can I bring in Joseph Bax at this point? Joseph, you have a question? Hi, Gary. Hey, Joe. How are oh, you? Good, how are you? Um, good. I first met you in 1991 at the ASK conference, and uh, you haven't aged a day, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> You're very, very kind. <laughs> uh, could you talk a little bit about the Dallas Citizen Council? And if you have any research on them, and if possible, um, like a list of who was in the Dallas Citizens Council in 1963. I have a list somewhere of who was who was in it, and it was the it was the players of Dallas. It, right. These were the, the the people, the movers and the shakers, and uh, so you you didn't get in that council unless you were somebody. Uh, how much they had to do with. Uh, uh, anything pertaining to the assassination, I don't think they as a group would even touch something like that. But individuals in that group would. And uh, it was, uh, it would be a group like this that would determine uh, whether the school book depository should be turned uh, torn down, which was their idea, which was the, what most people in Dallas thought should happen. Most of the movers and shakers wanted to tear the, the whole thing down. Uh, others uh, didn't, and so they won out. But a very powerful group at one time, very powerful. Yeah, they used they, to be called, by the way, they used to be called the White Citizens Council. Oh, really? That was the name before the Dallas Citizens Council? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, I was interested in them from uh, Texas trip planning research. Mm -hmm. I one, so anything mm -hmm. I can get on them would be great. Thanks. Thanks. Good to see you again. <laughs> this is a, sorry, there's another question from, from David, um, Gary, if it's okay. Um, do you reject Sherry Feister's, Feister's work, arguing that there was only one headshot from the South Knoll? Yes, I, I'm in conflict with that. Okay. And, and let me tell you why. Uh, she did not have the car to do a blood test, blood splatter test. She had only the Zapruder film and perhaps she could use Nick's and much more or something like that. But if you don't have the car and can trace the, the uh, blood elements and so forth, uh, you can't make a stipulation like that. I definitely believe that there were two simultaneous almost gunshot wounds to the head. And uh, nothing against her at all because she's a sweet lady. Uh, but, you know, I don't agree with her findings. Gary, did you yeah. ever interview Darrell C. Tomlinson or O.P. Wright? No, no, never. I never did. Like I say, man, there are so many that I would love to have uh, interviewed. Wally Weston lived until 70 or 80s. 
in, uh, before he died. And he wasn't 75 miles from me, but I didn't know it. What about S.M. Holland? No, because he pretty well was interviewed by Mark. <laughs> yeah. I heard that he walked around with two bodyguards at one point. Well, he may have, you know. He may have. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Gary, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for giving yeah. us so much of your time. Thanks so hey, much. It's you great to be with you guys, and, and y'all keep up the work, okay? Thank you very much. You're doing, you're doing well. great Thank work. you, Gary. Lovely to meet you. And lovely to meet Thank you. you. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 If I can figure out how to turn it off. <laughs> 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 y'all get off my screen.